Hello and welcome back to AP US History, Era 6. So in the last two videos, we have been looking at economic developments in the Western US. But in this video, for topic 6.4, we will shift our attention away from the West and back to the South, whose economy was in need of revitalization after the Civil War. So let's get started. In the years after the Civil War, some Southerners pushed for an industrialization of the South, since in many ways it was the industrial capability of the North that had paved the way for victory in the war. In some isolated regions, this vision of the New South took hold. Henry Grady, an Atlanta newspaper editor, tried to convince Southerners to give up their agrarian lifestyle and embrace industrialism, calling for the development of the New South. He even coined the term, arguing that one of the reasons the South had lost the war was because the North was far more industrially advanced. He envisioned a future for the South based on economic diversity, industrial growth, and laissez-faire capitalism. There were some New South successes with various Southern cities developing industrial centers. Birmingham, Alabama prospered from iron and steel manufacturing and mining and furniture production benefited other parts of the South. Likewise, James Duke made use of newly invented cigarette rolling machines to feed the growing market for tobacco and founded the American Tobacco Company in North Carolina in 1890. The most notable New South initiative was the introduction of textile mills. Soon the Southern states actually surpassed the New England states as the top manufacturers of textiles. Beginning in the early 1880s, northern capitalists invested in building textile mills in the southern Appalachian foothills of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, drawn to the region by the fact that they could pay southern mill workers at half the rate of workers in northern mills. Due to these low wages, the mills ended up only giving a modest boost to the southern economies in which they were built. For the most part, the southern economy remained agricultural, as it had always been, mostly running on the labor of sharecroppers. Sharecroppers was a system by which folks without enough capital to buy or rent land on their own could sign on to work the fields of a plantation owner on the condition that a portion of the harvest was shared with the owner. Now, in theory, this could have been a good thing, particularly for newly emancipated African Americans, as well as poor whites. But in reality, it was essentially a new form of slavery. Because prices on cotton and other crops remained low, sharecroppers and tenant farmers often fell into a cycle of indebtedness, usually to the landowner. This system left both black and white tenant farmers living in dire poverty, which is generally how Southern elites wanted things, as it was preserving the status quo. In addition, since a vast majority of the population had little money to spend, the Southern economy would stagnate, and many families were forced to send their children to work in order to make enough money to survive. Businesses also sometimes preferred to hire child laborers because they could be paid at much lower rates than adults, often with several children collectively making the same as one adult. Even though their speed of work was likely less, they weren't working that much slower. The photographs shown here depict children working in cotton mills, oyster processing factories, tobacco rolling factories, and in cotton fields. There were no laws regarding child labor until we get into the 20th century. Despite the existence of this new South, a lot was really staying the same. Once federal troops left at the end of Reconstruction, racial segregation became the basis for the structure of Southern society, supported by the passage of Jim Crow laws by newly reestablished democratic local governments. These laws would codify a racist ideology and provide legal support for the social, economic, and political oppression of African Americans throughout the South. Public and private segregationist practices began to spread and even into the northern states. Schools, churches, restaurants, libraries, 
all became strictly segregated facilities in the southern states. Social interactions and relationships between whites and blacks were also strictly regulated by law enforcement and society itself. These social customs reinforced a belief of right supremacy over African Americans and clearly created a two-class racial system. This system would reach its peak with the landmark Supreme Court case of Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896. The case originated in Louisiana, which had a law that required separate rail cars for black and white passengers. In 1892, a man named Homer Plessy challenged this law. Plessy was seven-eighths white and one-eighth black, but under Louisiana law, he was considered black. So he challenged the law by riding in a whites only passenger car. And when he was asked to leave, he refused and therefore was arrested. When the case reached the US Supreme Court, it ruled that racial segregation was in fact constitutional and did not violate the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment, which is what Plessy had been arguing that it did. The court said though, as long as the separate facilities were equal in kind and quality. This is where we get the phrase, separate but equal. Only Justice John Marshall Harlan opposed, noting that the intent of the law was clearly to segregate blacks and whites and to deny equality to black Americans. But really this decision was all Southerners needed to segregate all aspects of society. And this segregation would remain in place until 1954, when the court, led by Chief Justice Earl Warren, found separate accommodations were inherently unequal under the 14th Amendment. The case in question, Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Following the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, signs saying white only and colored appeared over business entrances, sections of parks, theaters, where Black Americans had to sit in what became known as the Jim Crow balcony, restrooms, drinking fountains, in places of business like post offices, diners, and banks. Black Americans were required to wait until all whites had been served first, in addition to sitting in separate areas. These laws were strictly enforced by an all-white police force that wholly supported the institution of Jim Crow and made every effort to use fear and intimidation to impose and protect a system of white supremacy. And it probably won't surprise you that while the races were kept separate, the facilities were in no way equal. In addition, Southern blacks lost many of the gains that had been achieved during Reconstruction. They were prohibited from serving on juries or holding public office. It was made exceptionally difficult to register to vote, often using poll taxes and grandfather clauses to deny African Americans the right to use the elective franchise. Was that black people were often accused of crimes they didn't commit, and many times they didn't even get to challenge the trumped up charges in a court of law. Instead, lynch mobs carried out vigilante justice separate from the legal system. In fact, in the 1890s alone, more than a thousand black people were violently lynched by mobs across the South, some 4,000 altogether. Despite the violence and limitations of Southern society, there were instances of resistance. Ida B. Wells was the editor of a black newspaper based in the South, and in this paper, she fiercely editorialized against lynching and Jim Crow laws as well. She received many death threats in an attempt to intimidate her into submission, and eventually her presses were destroyed by a mob. She fled to the Northern states where she continued her crusade, compiling all instances of lynchings throughout the South to prove that these were not isolated incidents and instead were targeted attacks against African Americans who were becoming economically prosperous and therefore posed competition to whites in the area. She argued that lynchings were used as a form of intimidation in order to maintain white supremacy. Another individual who promoted resistance to the status quo was W.E.B. Dubois, 
He was born in Massachusetts and had attended Harvard University, becoming the first African American to earn a doctorate from there. He later became a professor at Atlanta University, authored over 20 books, and was a founder of the NAACP. He demanded an immediate end to segregation and equal rights for all, advocating for the passage of new constitutional amendments to achieve those goals. He was a fierce advocate for black education and civil rights and wanted both to occur at the same time and immediately rather than first and then the other later. Another resistor you should know about is Booker T. Washington. He had been born a slave and had received an education during Reconstruction in Virginia. In 1881, he was named the head of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, a historically black university that was founded for the purpose of providing higher education to former slaves. He went on to become the nation's most prominent African-American leader. He taught skilled trades and offered ways for black Americans to make a living in the South despite racism. Now, Washington was a controversial figure in the fight for equality because his view was that African Americans did not, in fact, need to fight for their equality on a political level. Instead, he argued that black people needed to focus on improving economic situations first before demanding civil rights. Becoming self-sufficient economically, he said, would lead to power in the voting booth. Hence why he focused so much on education, because education was a pathway to economic self-sufficiency. He also created the National Negro Business League, which supported African-American-run businesses. But realistically, Southern society was tied so closely with white supremacy that Washington's ideas were deemed impractical by many. So that's pretty much what you need to know about the New South, topic 6.4 of the AP U.S. History Curriculum. Be sure to keep up with your reading, and I'll catch you in the next video.